We got into a serious argument one time about a hypothetical situation years before it was necessary. And, <laughs> and I'll give it to you real quick. We was talking about our son getting his first car. Two years ago, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. That boy don't even know how to drive yet, right? <laughs> and Melissa was like, we need to get him a, a, a hoopty, a beat up car, because mm. my dad always gave us beat up cars. Right. Kids don't need nothing, right? Facts. And I see a lot of people agreeing, like Marvin Sapp said, yep. this is how I fit, right? <laughs> Now, when I was a kid, I remember kids whose parents got them a nice car. I'm not talking about like a Maserati or something like that, but like strong Toyota, that, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Good Camry, Corolla, yeah. you know, yeah. but newer, yeah. right? So in my mind, this was never a conversation we had, but in my mind, when it was his age, I'm going to get him a nice Toyota that year. Melissa is like, my daddy got me a car that was the same age I was when I was born, and I'm like... <laughs> The same age right. I was when I was born. Same, that's true. They, <laughs> that's they, they all got a car that was born the, the same. It was their twin. <laughs> she had an '83. Sister had an '85 and '87. <laughs> I never got a car from my parents, so we mm -hmm. really, we never had that conversation about that. So we talking casually about it with our friends, and she like, he gonna get a hoopty. I'm like, he gonna get a new car. And then I realize we looking at each other. And now we fussing. I'm like, oh we. Oh, we don't really agree on this, right? So we went in therapy and we realized we had never, we see this situation differently. It's an honor to be at the Stellars. This is the 38th anniversary of the Stellar Awards. Give it up for the Stellar Awards, y'all. This is such an honor to be, and just give it up for this venue. Isn't this venue absolutely beautiful? So listen, I thank y'all so much um, for, y'all can have a seat, y'all can have a seat, thank y'all. It was like, we up, we up. Yeah, we up, we up. We up. <laughs> they ready to dance. I think they ready for the after party. Listen, uh, this season is about tough topics. First of all, let me ask y'all, who watched the Dear Future Wifey podcast? All right, all right, cool, cool. So this season is about tough topics, and we're gonna deep dive into some stuff that, you know, the church is a little leery about talking about. Some stuff may be a little taboo. Uh, but one of those things that uh, one of our sponsors that was brought to me, she began to talk to me about uh, something that was very dear to her heart. And I said, you know what? This is something I really want to talk about. What happens when the child becomes the caregiver? And um, so welcome to the stage. Where you at? Welcome to the stage. <laughs> the caregiver coach, Pat Bailey, y'all. You are amazing. Thank Isn't he you. amazing? How about that, right? Thank you. Thank you. So listen, um, one of the things that I always fear is my mom getting up in age where I have to become her caretaker. Um, and so that's the reason why I want to have this, you know, this quick little conversation with you so you can give insight to those of us that, do we have anybody that had to become a caretaker for your parents? Look at all those hands around. Oh yeah, that's amazing. So as, I was, as it was stated, I'm a caregiver coach. I was a caregiver coach and a caregiver for my dad at 21 while being a single parent. I was a caregiver for my mom at the age of 45. She died and succumbed to Alzheimer's after seven years. This was a journey done with my siblings. It is reasonable for us to have trepidation right. about managing the creator process and then having to care for our parents. We're in a lane where the authority of being in charge of our parents is not a natural shift. Right. We've moved away from multi-generational households. We were taught for years to have big mama, mm. big, you know, daddy, come on now. Yeah. They were part of our lives. I mean, the, the, the wisdom that they shared with us after World War II and migration, that changed. 
I believe that every last one of us should have some form of trepidation. But my goal and my objective is to help us understand how to manage that process without guilt. So you say without guilt. Tell me yes. what you mean by that. And going through the caregiver process with so many different families and friends, one of the things that I notice is there's so much worry that the caregiver has placed on their heart about if they're going to do this well. Right. Can I be part of the journey of my parent going back home to Father God? Because we have gotten a place within our Christian realm that we don't seem to understand this is not our home for real. Yeah, yeah. So there's opportunities of services that we may not reach out to. I'll give an example. Within the black community, if you say the word hospice, it's a dirty word, y'all. Yeah, yeah. Come on now. Oh, they didn't kill my mama and my daddy. <laughs> yeah. On average, in the black community, you may stay on hospice for two to three weeks. Within the white community, you're on hospice anywhere from seven to 15 years. It's a gap that huge. The gap is we are not trained to understand how to care for our parent. And I'm a senior. By the way, my son reminds me all the time, Mama, you do one more thing. That's one diaper that won't get changed. <laughs> I tell him I got people for that. <laughs> the takeaway is if we knew what I know now, long-term care insurance, if we knew about annuities, today knowing about annuities, if we would understand how to wrap our family in an economic financial bubble to cocoon their monies, we don't know about trusts, we don't know about wills, we just die. <laughs> and our family is not left with the Abrahamic moment yeah. of generational wealth. Generational wealth. Um, you know, I talked to you. Um, I want to do a full out episode. I want to bring people on the podcast as we unpack t uh, tough topics later on in the season. And I want to invite you back where we have couples and you begin to coach them and people that are, because when I posted the reel of you uh, the other day, a lot of people were DMing me and said, man, that they've, uh, they get tired. They, they've been taking care of their uh, parent for 10 years or eight years and they've just grown tired. They found that their relationships struggled going through that, that their husbands left them or their wives left the, the husband because they brought their mom in to live with them and it became such a burden. And so I want to help bring healing and, and reference and understanding because if services can be provided to lighten the load, then I need you, the caregiver coach, to help provide that, that uh those tools. It would be a, a pure pleasure. One of the things that we do is we, as we talked about on the show, I mean, guys, we bonded like instantly, <laughs> right? <laughs> we, we help you understand the, the, the mode of denial and we move you through discovery to help you be able to then manage the process. We help you understand how to gather resources locally. Aging is local. It's not national. Right. But we should have a sense of understanding, which is really funny. I love this one session that I did for a major mega church, and it was called From Wedded Bliss to Caregiver Stress. And it went on to say, you know doggone well, your mama didn't like me no way. <laughs> she moving where? Yeah. Ephesians 6 and 2 tells us, tells us that we must take care of the yeah. elderly. And by the way, it is the first commandment with a promise that you will live long. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? Y'all, I am not shame or shy to tell people I will have my 70th birthday this year. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. Yes. So I'm convinced that the time that I took in caring for my mom has a lot to do with me being able to wear these high heel shoes and when I get off this stage, I'm going to the flats. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> so you can hit me up. I'm caregiver coach Pat Bailey. Yes. The company is Finding New Tomorrows. That is my ministry. 
we're going to figure out what we can do for you and your family long term. That's good. That's Thank good. Thank you so That's much, good. ma'am. I really appreciate it. Good. Thank you so much. Thank That's you why so we're here. Much. Hey, Thank y'all you. give it up for the caregiver coach, Pat God Bailey, y'all. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ladarian thrusted suddenly into Child Protective Services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy. The likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy, with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted, yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally. Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just too many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? Joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care, should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical contexts, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, with much remorse, I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This is my do-over. This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm Lateris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today. Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, Latera R. Whitfield. Listen, are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, hit that subscription button and subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about upcoming episodes. We keep it lit. We live intentionally and transparently, so I've curated this awesome group of panelists who believe in full transparency. And so today's episode is about love and faith. 
Let me ask you, when you hear the word love, we're going to start with the single people. Alexis, when you hear the word love, what do you think about? Is it a painful thought? Is it a happy thought? What do you think? It's a lot of joy, a lot of black joy. I think of romance. I think of companionship. I think of us when I think of love. So it brings a lot of good memories. What about you, Lexi, when you hear the word love? Love is different for me. You know, Marvin and I were talking about that backstage, and we are the, what, what did you call it, Marvin? <laughs> <laughs> we, we said that uh, we're the, what'd you call it? He, he called it, we're the, bereave, we're the bereavement couple. <laughs> uh, and so love for me means a lot different from what it may mean for other people. When I think about love, I think about till death do we part. Yes. So when I think about that, I think about through thick and thin, sickness and health for real. So when I look for somebody, I don't look at if they look good or if they look good in a suit. I, I, I look at them and see if something happens to me, will you love me through it? That's good. Yeah. So. That's good. Well, that's good. Let me ask you that then, Faith. When you think about love, what do you think about? I think about the fact that every human has a need for some type of companionship, some type of relationship in their life. And I think that we all aspire to have a love that we can build on, um, a love that will elevate us, that will move us forward, not backward, not tear us down. Yeah. And I think that we're all united in having that goal and having a love that brings peace, joy, happiness, fulfillment, adds all of those things to our lives. Not that we're searching that somebody else has to make those things for us, yeah. but it's going to add those things into our lives. Melissa, love. When I think of the word love, I think of the warm and fuzzies when you think of love, um, kind of this very romanticized vision that we have about love. And then being married for 19 years, I also think about the work. Oh, I said 19 years. You got to give, give it up for that. 19 oh, years. That's a long time to be married to old Kev on stage. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think about the work involved to um, to be to choose someone on a daily basis and work on myself. Uh, he is working on him himself, and then we also have a relationship that's like a third party in this relationship. Yeah, uh, that you also have to focus on and cater to, and you know, intend to. Um, so yeah, I think I think love is it's a really beautiful thing and um, something I, clearly I've experienced all of these years. But I also would be like remiss to not consider the work that took me to get here 19 yeah. years later. Marriage be hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> marriage be hard. It was a be New York hard. Times bestselling book for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I think about love, I think about you know love is a word that comes and goes. You know I think. <laughs> Some people really don't know what it truly means to love somebody. Um, that's, that's deep. Whoa, that's deep. love. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, in this season, <laughs> hey man, <laughs> Melissa and I just celebrated 19 years, and I think it's best described now is love is managing the change, right? I think there it is. for us, we there started dating at 16, got married at 20 and 21 had children at 23 and 25, moved to L.A. at 30. Melissa and I just turned 40. Uh, she turned 40 this week. That's and a lot of information he didn't ask yeah. for. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, over those 20 years, that's a lot of transitions. Yeah. Your job, how you feel about yourself, a parent, where you feel like your career is going, you're managing loss and you know, things that you thought were important as you grow in age and change and, you know, relationship with God, all these things yeah. change and you're married to the same person who now thinks differently, feels differently. Uh, Sometimes some parts of Melissa have gone all the way back to how she was at 16 
at 38. You know what I'm saying? Or 35. What was it? 29? Uh, 29. <laughs> so it's really about being, loving someone enough, someone enough to be flexible to adapt to the version they are today. Now that's important right there. How many of y'all know how important that is? Because when people evolve, a lot of times you'll say, I didn't marry that version of you. And so you find it as an opportunity to walk away from that person. And that's very deep. Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, when you, life transitions happen. And there, some are big like kids growing up and, you know, uh, being born and then being teens. You know, so much of your life was devoted to like changing them and stuff. Now, as long as the Wi-Fi is on and their phone's connected to Postmates, they don't really need nothing. So, you know, who am I as a parent now? You know, that stuff starts to change. Yeah. Um, as you age, your career is very important to you, especially if you identify with your career and like your success. You, when I lost my job, the confident Kevin Melissa knew was gone. I was like, oh my God, I'm not good at anything. I'm not bringing in no income. I, but, and now I got to clean the house and cook. We reverse, you know, so I'm making her lunch. She kissed me on the way out. I was like, hold up, no, no. <laughs> This ain't right. So she loved me through that transition. Uh, and I think it's, and here's the thing I'll say, even if it makes me bad, or it makes me look bad. There was a version of Melissa that was easier to love because it didn't challenge me as much, right? Hold and, on, hold on, you gotta yeah. let that settle. You gotta let that settle. Yeah, there was a version of Melissa that was easier to love because she didn't challenge me as much, so it didn't challenge me. And then when she demanded more vulnerability from me, that was hard to do because I had gotten away with not having to do that for a long time. And I realized that in this stage of our marriage, I'm going to have to do this for us to make it. There's no getting out of it. And I could have been like, no, I ain't never had to do that before. Why are you asking me to do this? You're trying to change me. You're trying to change me. Well, if we're going to stay married, we're going to change. <laughs> so I, I never understood how people got divorced after 20, 30 years. Yeah. Like, what was y'all doing? Yeah. And now I see if you don't want to do no more work, you could be like, you know what? I'm just, I can't go through another change with you. I, or this version of you is too hard to handle. And I'm, I, I see that old version of you that was easier and I don't want to do that. So it takes a recommitment to work. And this is my last thing I'm saying. Uh, I realized that I just got back in the gym, started lifting weights again. And what's crazy about it is I used to be able to bench 225 pounds like five, six times. But if you stop lifting weights, your body will forget how strong you were. So you got to start all over again Teach. and get build right back. And it'd be crazy under there like, I used to be able to do this thing. Now I can't even get 145 up 10 times. And that's what marriage is like. You really got to be like, I'm going to have to start and learn this version all over again, and yes. you really, that's the commitment though. That's how you get to 20 years yes. happy. That's real. That is absolutely real. Kenny, when you hear the word love, you're, you're a balladeer. You write songs about love. Um, look at Lexi's on. Yes, he does. Amen. So when you hear the word love, what do you think about? I think about possibility. Mm. I think that uh, for everyone that does not feel like they have found love. It's possible. It's there. Love is hope. Um, love is safety. Um, for me to find love again, as some people say about my life that, you know, know a little bit of my story, um, I find that love is faithful. Love is faithful. Even a um, little play on word there with faith. I see what you yeah, did there. I see yes. what you did there. <laughs> So uh, with that, that's what I think of. I mean, I love every answer because that, I knew this panel was going to be like this, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't even want to prolong it. You have given so many nuggets, and I think we have to hear from yes. God. And, and, but, but for me tonight, what I represent is love being hope and possibility. Hope and possibility. Love is hope and possibility. That's good. Divine love. Um, when I think of love, I think of well-being. Well-being. Yeah. Why? I, why? Because I think that at the end of the day, if I say I love me, it means I'm committed to my well-being. If I say I love you, I'm committed to your well-being. I think so often when we hear that idea of love or someone says I love you, they say it in the word, but you can't see it anywhere in the deed. And so for me, it's about well-being. And I say that one thing is that love is to me our natural disposition. It's a natural? Natural. It's a natural disposition. The only thing that happens with love is it gets blocked. 
God is love. We were created in his image. The idea that we have to find love, I think, is a false pursuit. Because all we have to do is look in the mirror and love is looking right back at us. Woo! He said, look in the mirror and love is looking back at us. Look at <laughs> Bishop? <laughs> Why Marvin? am I the last one? <laughs> After all that we've heard thus far, <laughs> this is, when, when, when I think of love, honestly, I think of sacrifice. Mm. Um, since I'm, I'm not the only preacher on stage, <laughs> but, you know, the Bible says something profound that I think that many of us miss. It's probably one of the most quoted scriptures in the Bible, and that's John 3.16. Yeah. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only. Let me stop. For God so loved the world that he gave his only. If you're not willing to give your only, you're not really in love. Because love is based upon sacrifice. Yes. And whenever you are connected to someone who is supposed to be your love interest, your focus should be am I willing to sacrifice my only for that individual? Because if I'm not willing to sacrifice my only for them, that means that there are things that I'm holding back that I shouldn't be holding back and that I really believe that the person that I'm connected to is not worthy of the sacrifice that I'm supposed to make. Mm. So when I think about love, and this has been my thing forever, you know, it's about making the ultimate sacrifice for that individual and being willing to give all that I have and all that I am in order to ensure their happiness. Whew, Lord. That was good. Lord Jesus. <laughs> Bro, I don't know why they hit me like it did. It, it did something to me. It, it done did something. It got my eyes getting teary-eyed. Listen. When you think about that, being single, um, I'm, I'm gonna start with Alexis. And you hear that level of sacrifice. Have you ever loved somebody and you love the wrong person with such a sacrifice like that, investing in that person, giving them chance after chance and time after time, Ooh, and Lord. it made you say, Lord <laughs> Jesus. It made you say, I sacrificed for the wrong person. How much time do we have? So, <laughs> I, I absolutely, you know, when I, when I heard the bishop, I was thinking to myself, that's why I have not had love for a long time is because I didn't want to make those sacrifices. To some comments earlier, I didn't want to be vulnerable. Like, it's a lot of work to be a corporate woman and have a, a level of power um, and a level of expertise and then come home and lay that all down and say, okay, I'm going to follow you and in all of your imperfections. Um, but I'm reminded now, after being in love for about a year, that I'm imperfect as well. I'm, yeah. I'm constantly reminded of that, and it's that I have to give something of myself to get something so much more. And so when I think about love and, and romance and relationship, it's work that I have to do to unpack all of the things that I have been doing, been thinking that have been important as a single person and saying some of that I have to lay down for a relationship, for companionship, for me to take these next steps so we can be happy. And, and so it's less in my mind about a sacrifice and more about, you know, what are the things that we need to do so that we can be happy together? Yeah. And in that happiness, there's a us, there's not just a me. That's good. Listen, that's real good. Melissa, you said you've been married how many years again? Child, 19 years. Huh? 19 years. So when you thought about, you know, when you got married really, really young, Jonah. did you have any type of examples that was showing you that marriage takes sacrifice? Oh, absolutely. My parents uh, were the best examples in two, for two reasons. My parents were married for 25 years before they got divorced. So my entire childhood I lived in a two-parent household. So it was a really, really great example. When my parents divorced, they were also a really, really great example. <laughs> because I think if they could 
uh, go, maybe not today, but earlier, uh, if they could go back in time, they wouldn't have got divorced. And so it taught me the value of, of fighting for your marriage. Mm. Uh, we think that it's, you know, uh, easier on, and this, listen, let me say this, because I, I know this is going on YouTube, so I can see the comments. <laughs> <laughs> so let me address them. <laughs> Barring abuse, okay? Yeah, yeah. Barring abuse. Yeah. There is something to be said about fighting for your marriage right. and making a decision. Yeah. At the end of the day, I say this all the time, marriage and the vow that you make, when you say I do, you recommit that every single day in your decisions. Yeah. We're all on social media. If someone slides in your DMs, that's an opportunity to recommit yourself to your marriage. That's good. Because it's a choice. That's good. And I think every single day for 19 years, I've had to re-choose my partner, my husband. I've had to re-choose my, my, my marriage, my vows every single day. So how do you feel about Kevin being a low-key exotic dancer? He always got his, his shirt me. off online. <laughs> So I'm saying, did you, did you marry that when you... I absolutely did not. But this is the thing. My husband is losing weight, okay? So y'all got to respect it. Uh-oh. <laughs> Let me stop. Let me stop. It's careful. Break out. Yeah, I was going to say, don't threaten him with a good time. It'll be a different show. <laughs> oh, man. That's hilarious. So when you, when you hear about sacrifice, Kevin, what stage of your marriage? They always talk about the seven-year itch. Did y'all experience the seven-year itch? Was it at seven? Or? No. You know what's crazy? I feel like the first 10 years were great. Although they're all great in different ways. I think, um, I'd say probably we got married at 30-plus, and actually really the last five years, 30 plus what? Or our age was 30 plus. I was I'm like, sorry. What? That math don't matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After 10 years, yeah. uh, I'd say the last five years have been that, uh, I wouldn't say itch, but I would say the most challenging. And because it was honestly, it was unexpected. Because you think, oh, if they, people say you get through the th- first seven years, you're cool. Yeah. Well, the thing that I found is nothing in our life really changed those first seven years. So it was like our marriage really wasn't tested in that way. Uh, when we moved away from uh, Washington and our parents and our church home, it felt like, oh, now the clock started ticking. Now we're starting to make all of our decisions on our own. And I think um, the last five years is when you're close to 40, you start, to, what am I doing? What's my life like? Am I making the right choice? Who am I? Am I the person I used to be? Am I the person I want to be anymore? And that person, you're, and then there's a level of success that happened as well. So managing that transition was, was uh, challenging as well. And then as Melissa, I feel like, um, learned first, about vulnerability, transparency, things like that, and was trying to get me to come along, but didn't really have the language that I understood first. So, she, so it started off as like, we don't have deep conversations no more. So I'm like, girl, we is not 16, staying up till 2 a.m. Like, you sleep? I ain't sleep. You know what I'm saying? Like, after 15, 20 years, I know, I know all that stuff, right? Exactly. So I'm like, okay, I might have deep conversation. I come home, I put my phone down, look in your eyes. Let's be deep. That wasn't it. Yeah. Then she was like, <laughs> so she was learning more and learning more and learning more. So she was like, I need you to be more vulnerable. We, we got to that. And I was like, I don't know what that means. She was like, you never tell me when you're scared. And I was like, I thought about that for a moment. I was like, I never tell myself when I'm scared. So you were asking me to do something for you that I'm not even willing to face for my own self. Teach. And then what happened was as a man and then as a black man, you really ain't taught to be scared. So it's like, I don't want to show you no weakness ever. Yeah. So yeah. you like, you want me to be weak in front of you and cry? I mean, can you say nigga? Uh, <laughs> like, uh, no. yeah, I already kind of said it. Like, nigga, I'm out here. Like, I'm, you know, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll be saying it though. Um, <laughs> but then I realized that that mindset wasn't going to get us for the next five years. So I could have chosen to be like, I'm strong, I'm strong. And I honestly didn't understand that there's levels to strength, right? Strength isn't all brute brawn strength. You know what I'm saying? Strength also requires caring and nurturing, right? But I thought it was all, I don't cry, I don't cry. And then I realized once I opened up them tears, you can't even get that back. Once you unlock that part of yourself, 
Now I'm in therapy early. Now you late, five minutes. Let's tell the therapist on you that week. You know what I'm saying? So I think uh, to answer the question that you asked, which I don't remember anymore, but I'll just keep talking. (laughs) Uh, I had to be willing to Look do more to keep what was important. Yes. And I was willing to do that. And I'll be honest, being on social media and seeing what single people go through is the best reminder <laughs> to fight for my marriage. <laughs> they was arguing about ice cream dates on Twitter for all week. You can't grow on. I'll be like, you know what? This is why I just love my wife and I'm going to fight even harder because the last thing I want to do is be out dating right now because I feel, and I'm sorry to y'all, uh, whoever y'all is, but it is a great reminder to fight for what is important to me because God Almighty, I don't want to be out there with y'all. Lexi. You, you, you Lexi, wanna... I didn't mean, I wasn't looking at you when I said it. I was looking to the people. Well, you said wow. No, it's good. You said wow. I you. And I just, I'm sorry. I'm I got sorry. You. It's on and popping. How you feel about that? How you feel about that, Lexi? Uh oh. How you feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> No, you were talking about sacrifice. Yeah, and we talk about, no, even when we talk about the fact that um, being in these dating streets can be a little challenging or depressing. Do you feel like uh, it's challenging out there or do you have your pick of the litter? It's a mess. <laughs> no, no, no. No, it's, it's, what, it's what you say. It's what you say it is. Devon, let me tell you what I used to do. So I had this thing where... When I, was, when I was dating because of what happened with, with my husband and walking with him through cancer, what I did was I didn't go get therapy. I didn't, I didn't go get it. So I started making poor, very, very poor decisions. And so that led me somehow into dating people that I dated their potential. And I, and I used, and I, I didn't know I was doing it. And so I would, I would, I would, I would date guys that I would have to help. Yeah. Projects. Builder bears. Yeah. And, and, and I would really, really help and help too much. Devon, are you listening? <laughs> I would really, Whoa. I would, I would date these guys and I, and, and, and they would need so much help. They were, they were cute. <laughs> they had the swag. They, they knew what to say, and I love a man that can talk. Man, if you, if you talk good, I'm telling you, it, we can, we can, are you listening, Alexis? I'm telling you, these men. But I was dating potential, what they could have, what they were gonna be, what they were saying, and so I would help. And I would help financially. I said I would help financially. <laughs> there are people in this room that have helped people financially. I know I'm not the only one, (laughs) but I'll be the only one. I'll stand by myself, it's no problem. (laughs) But I dated potential until I got myself together. I'm the runaway bride, Devon. I I put it on Instagram. I was about to get married, Alexis. What happened? I put it on Instagram, everything. Am I lying, Marvin? And everybody, everybody sent me gifts and money, and I'm so happy for you. But the closer we got to marriage, let me tell you something about God. God is so faithful that he will give us red flags. He will expose, and I'm not saying this for a soundbite. Hear me clearly. God is so good to us because he will show us who that person is. But what I did is I would see it, and I would ignore it. I'm going to say it again. I would see it, yeah. and then I would ignore it, and I would keep going. That's my fault. God showed me what I had, and the closer we got to marriage, I said, the closer we got to the wedding date, everything was paid for. Am I Marvin? He back there saying, show sure was. You tell me the truth. I had an invitation. You. Thank you, sir. <laughs> everything was paid for in Jamaica. Sandals, Kenny, everything was paid for. Rooms, my family had paid $2,500 a piece to be there. And the closer we got, watch this, I kept saying, I can't call it off, Latiris, because everybody paid their money. But I knew in my soul that it wasn't right. Yeah. The more I sacrificed, the more he didn't appreciate me. And I called my mother and I told her, Dr. Knuckles, I know you're watching. Go see your patients right now. I told my mother, I said, Mom, I don't think I'm going to do it. And my mom said, baby, don't do it. We don't care about money like that. Don't do that. Don't do the all, because I will cry on this. Don't do that. 
And I called it off. I called all my family. I called everybody and I said, I can't do it. My family told me, hey, mm, we going anyway because we paid $2,500, nigga, and I bet you we going. Nigga, I bet you we going. We going. And they did. And they turned up and turned out. And I hate when people put things publicly and then when things go wrong, Devon, they say, respect my privacy. I got on Instagram and I said, I'm sorry, y'all. I just can't do it. Did I do it? <laughs> I said, y'all, I just can't do it. We had some differences and I can't go through with it, but I'm here in Jamaica. <laughs> I am the runaway bride. And I'm here to tell you right now, do not date potential. Yeah. Don't do it. When you see the red flags, see them, pay attention. And watch this, Devon, you're gonna love this part. I went and got therapy. <laughs> Therapy, God and therapy equals blessed. There it is, there it is. As, as you transition from that, did you ever have any regret? Did you ever have any moments where you want to go back to that situation? It's the best decision I've ever made and I know they're watching and I'm so sorry. And we're, yeah. The thing about my exes is they all follow me, Devon, all of them. <laughs> they create pages, they told me this, they create fake pages because they're blocked, but they follow me anyway. The best decision I ever made was leaving you. Whoa! <laughs> oh. <laughs> Y'all know my, my wife got this book. <laughs> And it's called Sis Don't Settle. <laughs> How to Stay Smart in Matters of the Heart. And everything that you're saying is so funny because I know she talks about so many of these things in that book. And finding the value in ourselves. Yeah. And I know you can talk about it way better than I can, but I, I, I love it that you found the value in yourself. Of course, the Lord illuminated his value in your life and what the vow actually was so that you didn't get all tripped up in that because then you'd have to live with that and, and maybe guilt and maybe other things that you'd have to add to the therapy. But I know you, you probably... were, that speaks to your strength because so many people, they're so concerned about what everybody else is going to think, but it's your life. It's your life and your decision because I've seen that so many times where we did engage, we did our counseling before we got engaged. Yes for this very reason, because we wanted to yes. have these tough conversations before we ever decided we were going to marry each other. Because what, what, what was gonna happen when we had those conversations and started peeling back those layers after we made the announcement, after we told our family, after we told our friends, you feel pressure. You feel pressure, you're concerned about being embarrassed and what everybody else is gonna think when it's the rest of your life, the biggest decision you're gonna make, the person who will have the most influence on your career, on your health, on your happiness, on your mental health, your emotional health, is the person that you will walk through life with. Facts. It is the most integral decision you will make. It is not to be taken lightly. You cannot care that the wedding invitations have already been sent out. Yeah. So, so when I hear stories like that, I think it's amazing because um, because it, it speaks to, it speaks to that strength. And I wanted to say, you know, I, I wrote my book because you all have been married for more than 15 years. I dated for 15 years. I was a professional dater. So when you talk about red flags, I wanted to see when a red flag came my way, I wanted to see how red the red flag was. <laughs> I wanted to test the red flag. <laughs> we'll see, see, is it really red or what, what's happening here? So I went through all of those stages. Every phase, every scenario you think could happen in the dating world, being ghosted, being rejected, uh, you know, thinking I've met the person I'm going to marry and instead of getting an engagement, I get a breakup. Every scenario. And what I found myself, um, Lateris, we, we talked about this before, I realized that I had become cynical about love. And I wanted to get married. And, and what was happening, though, I had all of these thoughts and beliefs about what I really thought about love and relationships. And then I realized you cannot be a cynic about love 
and then expect to attract it in your life at the same time. Yeah. So I had to start working on all of those experiences that I had that started um, you know, making me fear going into another relationship. And what I was really doing was trying to protect myself from being rejected again, but that fear was just poisoning my perspective. Because even when a good person came along, I was so scared of being hurt again that I would make them pay for something they had nothing to do with in my past. That's good. That's good. That's good. Devon, let's talk. Um, How hopeful are you in regards of love? When you think about love, when you think about, let me ask you, do you want to get married again? And and how hopeful, when you see... (laughs) Whoa! That was intentional. I just, he asked me a personal question, so I yeah, asked him personally. Yeah, Whoa! Yeah. So when you think about, when you look at these dating streets and you see what's out here, um, you know, and as Kev on stage said about looking in these social media streets, hearing this rhetoric about what women are looking for and what guys are looking for, you got this red pill community against the pink pill community and all this type of stuff. Um, how do you feel when you think about love? Without, I'm talking about straight on a, I want to say carnal level because we can always put faith over it. We're going to transition to that. But when you think about it just on spiritual alignment, I see I don't went faith again. When you think about alignment, how do you think about the possibility of finding love again? Yeah, you know, again, I think it goes back to, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's not about looking because that looking spirit creates a, uh, a vulnerability, not a vulnerability where you're like expressing yourself. It's like you're vulnerable to someone taking advantage of you. You know, if you want to talk spiritually, go to Esau and Jacob. When Esau was hungry and he was looking, he was in position to be taken advantage of. So I'm not looking for love, but I'm ready to receive love. That's a different way to do it. Because when I'm ready to receive, I stand in my power, I stand in my authority, I stand in my identity, and then I let God bring me. There it and is. then I can evaluate and say, oh, this is great, or this is the right fit, or not the right fit. But if I'm out here looking, that implies a desperation. Mm. And, and so often, you know, and I, I did a, a sermon about a month ago called One of One, uh, the truth about being single. And this idea, you know, I'm just in church, this pressure to push people into marriage, yes. to make people think if you're single, something's wrong with you. I'm here to tell you we're all single, even if you're in a couple. When God created Adam, he created a single. When God created Eve, he created a single. Yeah. The couple, one plus one equals one. If I can't be one with me, how can I be one with you? Facts. If I think that being with you is better than being with me, the couple is going to suffer. So when I think about love, I think... First and foremost, Devon has to learn how to love Devon. Instead of saying, oh, well, I want this person to fix me or I want this person to make up the difference in what I'm not doing. So for me, I'm on a mission to say, one, it's okay to be right where you are. Lexi, are you listening? I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to be right where you are. It's okay. <laughs> Do not buy into the idea that if I find someone, I will be happier. Yeah. Happiness is a state that has to be cultivated right now. If you're waiting for someone to be happy, you're going to find somebody. And I promise you, if you're not happy now, you won't be happy then. So I have, I've been learning, okay, love myself, you know, value myself, look back over my past. Where did I, you know, go wrong? What can I learn? Right. And as I learn that, then I'm better qualified to identify who the right fit is. A lot of times we may choose somebody um, because we don't know who we are. Yeah. And the more we come into an identity of who we are, the better we'll be able to choose. And the one thing, last thing I would say is, as painful as love is, don't close. Don't close. That's good. Don't close. No. So I'm open, right? I'm not going to close my heart. I'm going to keep my heart open. Why? Because this is the thing called life. Yeah. And I don't want to close because of what happened in the past. I want to be open to what God is doing right now. That's good. Can I say something really quick? Jump for in. You? Um, 
I just wanted to speak to uh, what Devon was talking about in the singleness in, in marriage. It's this idea called differentiation. I actually think that's kind of like the thing Kevin was alluding to in the last five years. I think what happens in marriage is that we become consumed in our role that we forget the individual. And especially women specifically, we become so consumed in being a wife being a mother and, you know, doing all of those things that you forget about taking care of self. And I don't mean that in like the very superficial getting my nails done, my hair done, but like actually asking yourself, what do I like? And being okay if that answer is different than what your husband likes. And having a conversation about those differences so you understand when you're making um, an accommodation or when you're making a compromise. Because yeah. when you make a lot of accommodations in your, in your relationships, resentment builds. Because you feel like all I'm doing is, is giving to you. All I'm doing is giving to you, or I'm sorry, accommodating. All I'm doing is accommodating you. All I'm doing is doing what you want to do. All I'm doing, and nothing of what I want. And sometimes you do have to do that. Don't get me wrong. A, a lot of relationship is accommodation. But it is also compromise. It's saying, this is what I want. This is what you want. Let's create something different. That is, I give a little bit, you give a little bit. And I think that is um, the hard part about, or one of the like sneaky hard parts about relationship is being okay to be different or differentiating yourself from your partner and still maintaining the we of it all. Yeah. I'm not saying to go be so differentiated that you haven't established the we because that's important as well. But I can't be so consumed with the we that I forget the me. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's good. Marvin, when you think about dating, as a bishop, as a bishop dating, <laughs> how wow. challenging is that? Well, I'm on bishop. Um, so, so when I think about being a pastor, preacher, teacher, um, recording artist, executive, all the things that I do that encompasses who I am. You're asking, how do I date or do I date? Is that the question? That's the question. I do. What? Absolutely, date. Right. Wait a minute. You are out here with the bishop now. You are out with the bishop. Do tell. But, Wait but let me a say this. Minute. Let, let me say this. I'm, 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 I'm a very. When your life is public, right? And uh, you know everybody knows you, but you don't know who they are. Yes. There's some things that you try to protect, and I think one of the challenges that this generation has is understanding the difference between secret and private. Um, I date privately because of the simple fact that my whole life is public. Facts. And because my entire life is public, I'm not trying to keep you a secret as much as it is that I'm trying to protect you from the attacks that could come your way that you may not be ready for. Teach, teach. So for me, dating is different because of that. Right. Um, also, I think one of the challenges as well as, as well rather, is it can be difficult for women to understand that. And the reason why is because I believe very personally that we live in a society that is overly exposed. Right. And because we live in a society that's overly exposed, everybody wanna know who everybody with and why can't you post me on your social media <laughs> The reason why you're doing it is because you're probably doing something sneaky. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, is that no, the reason why I'm doing this is simply because I'm trying to protect the only thing that I can protect. Because I can't protect every aspect of my life, but my personal life 
is my personal life. That's good. So, so you, have to, you have to learn how to fit into that space. And for many, honestly, it doesn't work for them. And, and I am cool with it not working for them. Um, but, I mean, you know, when it comes to dating, dating is one thing, looking for marriage. I, 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 I sort of agree with Devon, but I also understand something. And, and let me say this. I talk about my late wife a lot. Be 14 yeah. years in next month uh, that she'll be gone, uh, transition from this life to life eternal. But I learned some very valuable lessons from her, especially during the dating process. And the reason why I ended up choosing her was very simple. Because I knew in marrying her, she was not just marrying the person, but she was marrying my purpose. And mm. I think, I think what, what, what many people fail to realize is that when you are trying to connect to a Devon, a judge, a Kev on stage, any person who has any level, if you will, of notoriety or prestige or however we may look at power, you have to understand that you're not just connecting to that individual. You're connecting to all aspects of them. And especially when it comes to being a pastor. Yes. Women can tear your church up. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so you, you have to really be selective. Now, let me say it like this, too, and I'm closing. I promise you, this is my close. Your second closing. Uh, I, I usually do three, but I, yeah, I'm just going to do two. I'm just going to do two. One of the things that has always bothered me is that we live in a world where when the president is looking for a vice president, we never know who that person is until they are vetted. There it is. We need to learn in the dating space Teach. how to make sure that we have vetted the individual. Teach knowing everything that we need to know before we go public so that we won't be embarrassed by things that we find out later about yeah. them. So it's all right, ladies, men, it's all right for you to date privately, to not let everybody and their mama know who he or she is until you find out everything that you need to know so that once the unveiling happens, you won't be embarrassed by finding out stuff that you should have found out during the process, not about the flutter and the excitement, yeah. but thinking and processing before you move forward. That's my close. That's good. That's good. Lexi, have you dated Christian men? That's all I date. What you trying to say? I'm just, I'm going to ask you. Because of my pants, you don't no, think no, that I'm I... No, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you two questions. Ever since I walked in here, you've had something against me, Latarius. <laughs> have, you dated, you. have you dated unbelievers? No, I won't Never. do it. Uh, how, so so how do. important is your faith when choosing your purpose partner? You got to remember, I've been married before. Right. So my thing is, if two people... Don't listen to the Holy Ghost. Here's the thing, because we're not always going to agree. Right. So there are going to be sometimes you're going to make me angry, right? And I won't be able to hear you because I'm angry right now. Right. You, I, I'm not agreeing with nothing you're talking about. Everything you're saying is just falling on deaf ears. I can't hear you. But when the Holy Ghost says, now you know you're wrong, right? Yeah. I have to be fully submitted to the Holy Ghost so that I can come back and apologize to you even when I don't want to. If two people can't do that, we're not going to make it. The percentage of people who are of faith getting divorced is over 50%. Right. If both of us aren't committed to the Holy Ghost, we're not going to make it. I can't afford to date someone that is not filled with the Holy Ghost. Not just filled, but submitted to it and will listen. Because I'm listening. But until we're both listening, it ain't gonna work. There's no way. 
I'm so glad <laughs> that I listened to the Holy Ghost. Can I say, there was one time where my, my, my husband and I, I knew that he hated it when we would get into it. I knew that he hated it. I would do it on purpose, ladies. I would leave the house. He hated that. He always told me, I don't like it when you leave the house. It makes me feel a certain kind yeah. of way. But I couldn't win the argument. So when I couldn't win the argument, I would leave. It. All I would do, y'all, is get in the car and go around the corner. I, was just, <laughs> I wouldn't go long, you know. But I would go around the corner. And one time, the Holy Ghost said, stop doing that. He doesn't like that. Stop doing that. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't have stopped if I hadn't heard from the Holy Ghost. I'm so glad that I listened to the Holy Ghost because little did I know that we only had five years mm. together. Had I not been submitted to the Holy Ghost, I would have wasted time being a silly woman, tearing down my house, having silly arguments, and then when he went to go be with the Lord, I would have regretted everything that I had ever done and that weight on me would have been too much to bear. Thank God that I listen to the Holy Ghost. If you don't date someone who is filled and is submitted to the Holy Spirit, keep it moving. You better preach, Lexi! Come on now, that keep it moving though. <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> I think it's also a, a double click on that because I was naive enough to, to be in my 20s and, and in my 30s to say that, oh, this is an amazing Christian man and everything's going to work out. And there's still work. Like, I have to be vulnerable. We have to communicate. You need to get up and go to work every day. <laughs> like, like, the Jesus stuff is the foundation, <laughs> but there's everyday stuff like that we got to get up and do. And I think I used to just think, you know, I'm like just romantically, I, I mean, I had no clue like of the work you got to do and the not, not necessarily even sacrifice, but like the, the compromises, the adjustments. I got to be quiet sometime and just listen. I got to go do things that I may not be excited about doing, but like that's what companionship and partnership is. And so it is all of this Jesus love and the Holy Spirit and all of that, but it's work. I needed counseling and I go to counseling now so that every time I get this urge to be like, um, maybe this isn't it or, or maybe I got to do more work. You know, every time I get those urges, the counselor is like, let's go back to to why you came. Yeah. Let's go back to your commitment. Yeah. Let's go back to all of the things that you love about your, your mate. And so it's work. And I think, you know, I, I spent a long time thinking of this fantasy of what love should be, could be. And now I'm in the midst of the work and it's, it's wonderful. Like Miss Kev on stage said, but it's also work. And, and that's what the companionship is. It's work, but it's a great journey, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm enjoying the space that I'm in now, but it's work. That's good. When you think about, when you think about this whole thing about high value woman and high value man, do you refer to yourself as such? No, I am a woman who is looking for a heterosexual man <laughs> who enjoys the company of women, uh, past, present, and future, and, and, and just is looking for love. Um, a strong man, a, a black man, a good man. If you have children, a, a great father, not a runaway father. I mean, just those good characteristics. So it's, it's less about, you know, who I am or what my job title is. Today it could be this, but tomorrow it could be that. Teach. And Alexis is still looking for amazing love with a, and a connection. Like, those things don't go away. Money has nothing to do with the connection I have with someone. When he says, hey, y'all you, you, change the color to blue. Okay, come on. Let's go find you something to wear. And don't you have some shoes? And let's lay it out. Like, that's the friend that I want. And that has less to do about the money. The money helps. Um, <laughs> She but said all more, that to, money helps. more to do about like <laughs> just that friendship and, and all of the amazing things that love is and that love brings. Alexa, let me ask you this. If you found a guy with all those things, but he wasn't making money that you deem as acceptable, would you submit to that leadership? I don't know what acceptable <laughs> is, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
Look, I'm, I'm happy with what I have right now. And I'm going to keep that and be satisfied with that. No, but he's an amazing man. And, and like I said, it's less about the dollars yeah. and the cents and more about the care, the love, and the companionship that's important to me. Marvin, you about to say something? No, nah, man, we was just having a conversation. No, nah, say it. I want you to say it. I heard you about to say that's an important we was, question. We was just having a conversation. We we, 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 I, I, you know, this, this, is a, this is a good place, segue, to ask this question because I had a conversation with somebody recently, and the conversation was similar to this. They said that men love unconditionally, but women love conditionally. Now, 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 now hear me when I say this. Uh -uh. This, this is what's the conversation that men love unconditionally and women love conditionally, meaning that a man can see a woman and no matter what walk of life she comes from, oh, yeah. and no matter not only what walk of life she comes from, he can be a billionaire and he'll marry a nanny. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because they love unconditionally. They'll look at you and love you and marry you however you are. However, it's different when it comes to a woman. A woman loves conditionally. And the reason why I say that is because y'all ain't gotta like it, it's the truth. <laughs> it's the truth. And let me prove your conditions. The question was just asked, if he had all of the qualities emotionally yeah. that you needed, you got the bag. Yeah. Could you marry somebody yeah. that doesn't have... No, I'm just I'm using yours as an example, not, not you. But would you marry someone if you had the bag and they didn't have the bag, but they had what you needed emotionally? Yeah. I know somebody right now, mm -hmm. one of my best friends in the world. Him and his wife, that's them. They got married, have been married for 25 plus years, she has always been the bag, and he has always been that support. That's rare. Yeah, you said 25 years. 25 years of marriage. Yeah. That's rare. And that's a question. That's a good question. Because the reality is, is that most of you all, I'll say 90% of you all sitting in the room, you wouldn't. And this is the question that every woman, you so wrong, bruh, over there. Bishop, can I say something? Oh, would, would, you marry, would you marry somebody? Would you marry somebody that was in your position? <laughs> if, 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 if someone came up to you that was doing what you were doing, living the life you were living, financially where you are, credit score the way yours is, would you marry them in your position? Some of you would, some of you wouldn't. Because there's only like seven of y'all that said yes. <laughs> what are you about to say? Go ahead, yeah, Listen. I was going to say that, um, hey, Jonathan and Marinos. <laughs> Just walking up in here. Say hey to the panel. Everybody say hey, Jonathan. Hey, What's up, Jonathan? Hey, he's going to just slide in. Just going to slide in. Um, okay, so listen, I, I'm not disagreeing with clearly the legend that is Marvin Sapp, but I am going to offer a different perspective. <laughs> okay. It's not disagree. That I think that the currency of men is a little bit different and the value system is different. So the condition that a man would put on the woman is she going to be cute. She's going to have a body and he's going to expect what he expects. <laughs> what is that? What does he expect? Because what does he expect? What are, you're a stay-at-home wife. You ain't got no job. You ain't got no kids. You ain't doing nothing but shopping. I'm going to need you to lay down and be nice tonight every night when I expect you to do. And so I just think that currency is just, and the value system is a little bit different. That's the first thing I'm going to say. That's a woman's perspective. The second yep. thing I'm going to say is... That, that's, that's a woman's perspective, though. Okay, because, then. Because that's not all men. I think, I think when you had said millionaires, when I had thought about the wives that they had been with, they be cute, though. <laughs> may, may, you, you must not have watched a couple of these millionaires that I'm talking about. Oh, okay, okay. I don't, I'm not disagreeing, so yeah, I'm going to let you have the point because I don't disagree. Uh, the other perspective is that, um, God dang, I forgot what I was going to say next. It's on purpose. 
It was on purpose. It's on purpose. God it was on purpose. He didn't want you to say it. He didn't want me to say it. You gonna it's remember gonna, it? In a but he it's brings all right things now. back right to now. my remembrance. So I just give me a second. It right it's gonna come. I told you it's coming right now. I it's gonna come back. I don't remember. I ain't got nothing to say. God is good. Amen. I'm just saying, God is good. I love him. Amen. This is been just, great. Listen, for real though, I just threw some stuff out there just to mix some stuff up. I know it. I love it. I love it. No, I remember. I told you the Holy Ghost was going to bring it back. <laughs> the other thing I was going to say is, from a woman's perspective, is that sometimes a man's ego be bruised <laughs> when a woman makes more money. And so even if we're willing, we got to negotiate stroking your ego, making sure you know you the man, making sure it's okay, baby. I still respect you as a man. You can pay the bill. Here's the, here's the credit card. <laughs> Let me make sure you feel respected. <laughs> now I got to go over and above to respect your man. Come on, come on. Uh-uh. <laughs> That's what's wrong with y'all. That't do us. Don't was do a, us. It was a five dollar bill anyway. Unconditionally respected <laughs> and loving. And that was the way I did not disagree <laughs> with the legend that is Marvin Sapp. <laughs> Marvin, I, it was I, her. She I, had all I the can, black women. I can see. I can see. <laughs> you, you had an away game right That's your one flesh, Doc. You're That's your game. one flesh. <laughs> we say, Kevin, he's at an away game? This is an away game. The women was like, yeah, Marvin, yeah. What's up now? It was too late. They were standing up. They were standing up. That's why he was like, you know what? I ain't going to do this. I ain't, I ain't got nothing to say. I still feel how I feel. Y'all feel how y'all feel. <laughs> You and your wife got married at a young age. How important was your, was your faith in choosing her? Uh, I mean, listen, true story. I proposed to Melissa on Easter Sunday. <laughs> Can't get no save than that. With a message. I talked about God as the ring in the covenant, amen? The same way he married the church I want to marry. That's what I did on Easter Sunday. Because I love her. Uh, but no, it's, it's the absolute, like Lexi was saying, it's, it's, the, it's the foundation, it's the core programming, it's the DNA of who we are. And I think that it's important to, like Lexi was saying, you marry somebody who feels that way, right? I think there's certain, uh, to a, help, a happy, healthy marriage, I think there's certain uh, core things that you really can't, you know, not agree with right. and have a healthier marriage, right? I think, and faith is one for us. If Melissa did not believe, or if I did not believe, I don't I agree with Lexi. I don't think our relationship would work because of how important yeah. it was to our life. Now, some people may not grow up like the way we grew up, so it might not be important to them. But for us, it's like, if you didn't grow up how I get, you probably won't even really get me to my core. And we won't have the same uh, ideology uh, about life. So, I think it was a, a core tenet to our marriage. Let me ask you this, um, because you talked about you didn't experience the seven-year itch around seven years, it's closer to 10. Uh, when you look at that trajectory, was it after you started making more money? Like, did y'all have more happiness when y'all were struggling versus when y'all are doing extremely well? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think we had it um, accurately timed like that. I think. You know, the thing about marriage that's beautiful is there in 20 years, you're going to be up and down, right? Yeah. So even though we make good money, even every year of making good money isn't a good money year, right. right? So luckily for us, I think the best thing that happened to us is we both came with nothing yeah. and we had a great time with nothing. So if we went back to nothing, 
our relationship wasn't built on that foundation. So when we ain't had no money, Melissa used to get these coupon books at her job. It was like $2 Mariners games. We would go to $2 Mariners game. We would go to the park. We'd go to Portland, because in Portland, they didn't have no sales tax. And we still didn't have no money, but we'd be like, dang, we have money. We could get this with no sales tax. We drove down there to still not have money to buy the stuff. So, <laughs> so I think for us, I. We are just able to do more things now, but it's not the foundation of our relationship. And I don't think it was any of the problems that we had were related to finance. I will say uh, sometimes, honestly, actually, it does create some problems. And I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one. Um, <laughs> we can't argue about no money when we don't have none because there's nothing to argue about. Right. Right. That's what I'm saying. One thing we found is that as we started making more money, we see money very differently. Mm-hmm. And that became a problem for me. I grew up, my family didn't have nothing, and we still came to Vegas. We was out here, we was at Circus Circus, but we was here. We could never stay at the Bellagio, no, no. We was in that manor. We was at the manor. We wasn't even the real circus. We was with the animals, but we was out here. So. <laughs> Melissa is very much like her dad. Her dad is a saver. He's planning for a rainy day and a storm. She saw her dad doing the bills one time and and it just locked in her mind. I am like, if we got it, we out here. You feel me? You see the Gucci shirt? I'm, I'm, t- I'm out here. I could have had a regular shirt. I have. You know what I'm saying? So once we had access to that, that's when we realized, oh, if we have X amount of money, Melissa wants to save it, and I'm like, we might not have that next year. Let's go to Vegas. Let's go to Dubai or whatever. So I realized one, we got into a serious argument one time about a hypothetical situation years before it was necessary. And... <laughs> And I'll give it to you real quick. We was talking about our son getting his first car two years ago, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. That boy don't even know how to drive yet, right? <laughs> and Melissa was like, we need to get him a, a, a hoopty, a beat up car, because mm-hmm. my dad always gave us beat up cars. Right. Kids don't need nothing, right? Facts. And I see a lot of people agreeing, like Marvin Sapp said, yep. this is how I fit, right? <laughs> Now, when I was a kid, I remember kids whose parents got them a nice car. I'm not talking about like a Maserati or something like that, but like strong Toyota, that, you know what I'm saying? Good Camry, Corolla, you know, but newer, right? So in my mind, this was never a conversation we had, but in my mind, when it was his age, I'm going to get him a nice Toyota that year. Melissa is like, my daddy got me a car that was the same age I was when I was born, and I'm like... (laughs) The same age right. I was when I was born. <laughs> same, they, they, it's true. They, <laughs> they all got a car that was born the, the same. It was their twin. <laughs> she had an eighty-three. Sister had an eighty-five, and eighty-seven. <laughs> I never got a car from my parents, so we mm-hmm. really, we never had that conversation about that. So we talking casually about it with our friends, and she like, he gonna get a hoopsie. I'm like, he gonna get a new car. And then I really, we looking at each other. And now we fussing. I'm like, oh, we. Oh, we don't really agree on this, right? So we went in therapy and we realized we had never, we see this situation differently. And it's not about whether he gets a hoopty or a Camry. It's about whatever he gets, we decide what it's going to be. But not that we just take in what, I'm like, Camry or nothing, this is my son. I'm Kevin on stage. And she's like, I don't care who you are, Kevin on stage. I knew you as Kevin. That's what I feel like she would have said. I didn't, we didn't have the argument, but I feel like so she was, she was, you know. So I think it's things like that, you know. Like this year, I will be completely transparent. We had an accountant, God bless his heart, amen. He, he didn't do math the way he should have. So we got hit with a tax bill that I was like, oh my, my God. God. <laughs> wig oh fell off. My, wig fell off and I'm bald. So I'm immediately, all right, I gotta go to work, I gotta get this, gotta blah, 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 blah. So when we get it back up, once we get back, I'm like, and now we finna do this. And Melissa's like, Boy, are you? Did you remember just what happened? We need to save just in case the tax man come. I said, "Girl, we pay the tax man. He can't come like a thief in the night. He can't hit us twice in the same year." <laughs> we paid up with the tax man, baby. Let's go back outside. <laughs> she like, what if he come again? He ain't coming again. So, I, so we have to have those conversations. Because if you don't, you'll get into an argument. I feel like, man, she holding me back. And she, I'm, I'm trying to be out here. And she's like, he's not wise with the money. That's the conversation you can have. And when we were broke, it's just enough to feed us. We can't argue because we can't go nowhere. <laughs> so it don't matter what we wanted to do. The lights are still on. That's the victory for today. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
Oh, God, that's hilarious. I'm going to ask y'all, and I can talk to y'all all day. Quickly, I want to talk about uh, what y'all have coming up. Didn't they just do an amazing job when I say I absolutely enjoy talking to y'all? Um, Alexis, what do you have coming up? Well, look, just go to mahogany.com and get all your cards, gifts, and more. It's that simple. Mahogany.com, we love you. We got everything you need. Mahogany.com. There it is. Lexi. Geek Cosmetics. I own a cosmetic company. Thank y'all. Y'all know. Y'all know. Okay. I need y'all to go to Geek Cosmetics. That's G-E-A-T Cosmetics.com. And uh, it's doing very well. I'm, I'm, Good. I'm very happy. How long have you had that? Uh, it's on, it'll be three years in November. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cool. Proud of you, Queen. Marvin. I ain't got nothing going on right now, for real, though. <laughs> I, I don't, I mean like... You had a whole lot. Last no, time no, I seen you had a put, movie like, out, you was doing... Was, oh, that's that? Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, last year, uh, Devil Would Have Made It, the movie, came out. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's on TV One. Yeah. Uh, you go on demand. Um, I have a brand new... Well, last year, I have a brand new CD out. Uh, Marvin Sapp. Uh, what is that CD called, Jesus? Uh, <laughs> I got 15. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the name of the CD. Um, uh, but it's a CD, it's, it's a white cover. Just look for the white, what it's called? Substance, there it is. Substance, Substance my new CD, I was called Substance. <laughs> and uh, just, just go to marvinsapp.com, you can check out everything. Well, hold and, on, uh, hold on, Lex, did you hear that flex? He said, I got 15. I got 15, I got 15 albums. I mean, it's just, I mean, you, I mean, you know, kind of like- Sing a little a bit, sing, what's the single? What's the single? Sing a little bit. Little How song, the single, go. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Why would you put me on the spot Let's like go. that? Let's go. You couldn't remember the title. Maybe you can remember the words. Let's go. <laughs> I, 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 honestly, right now, I'm on the spot, so I don't remember the songs. I really don't. I, don't, I Must Be Close. That's another album. Come on, Marvin. Oh, they know the words over there. <laughs> go ahead. Um... I just produced a film called Flamin' Hot. Uh, it's oh, yeah. Creator. Yeah, thank yeah. you for those of you that have seen it. Uh, it's on Disney Plus and Hulu. It's about the creator of Flamin' Hot Cheetos. Uh, his name is Richard Montanez, and the movie is just taking off. I mean, yeah. it's, I can't even believe how many people have seen the film, how inspiring it's been, uh, what it's been for the Latino community and the faith community. I mean, it's just a great film. So if you get a chance, check it out. Flame it's on high. Hulu and Disney+. Plus. It's the only movie in the history of Disney to be on both Hulu and Disney+, Plus at the same time. Amazing. Salute, King. Great. First, thank you so much for having us here tonight. This is, um, I hope it's been a blessing to all of you as it was to me, as it has been to me, uh, we have a six-month-old daughter, and um, I have yeah. just been in this journey the last six months of rediscovering who I am now yeah. as a mom, and uh, it's been uh, an awakening for me, but I'm coming out of, um, you know, these, these last six months with her and going back to work. I'm hosting a show on Oxygen Now called Killer Relationship, and also, if you go to my website, I'm really passionate and getting back to the work I was doing before, which is on my book, Sis Don't Settle. There's a free chapter on my website. If you go check out faithjenkins.com, you can sign up to get a free chapter of the book. And it's one of my favorite chapters because it's about how to deal with rejection yeah. and uh, going through rejection and dating and relationships and even from work and jobs and uh, how I bounced back from that and how it made me stronger. And uh, I'm now I'm, I'm going to get into some coaching based on my book, and I'm really looking forward to doing that. So that's all through uh, my website now. So uh, I hope to uh, see you all virtually in the near future as I host some of these classes based on my book. Good, good. I'm gonna go back, Kenny. Thank you. Um, I have a, a problem, I'm getting ready to say a CD, wow. <laughs> I have an album yeah. called Here to Stay. And uh, we celebrated a, a number one just a couple months back. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We're really excited about that. And we, we're going to try to do it again. I have a no, what was that number one uh, song? It was called Take a Dose. There it is. And um, this, the, the next single is called Never Knew. And it's about to come out in about two weeks. Real excited about that. Um, 
I'm so happy to be Skylar's dad and to yeah. raise this baby with you. You know, it's, it's amazing. Like, it's a different journey. Every day is something different that we learn. It's like we become God and we get to see these little beings make mistakes. Yes. Take their first steps where you have to hold them up. A lot of the very things that we go through in our walk with Christ is what I see with this child, you know? And um, so I'm excited about life. I feel like I have a brand new beginning to my life. Yeah. Kenny, so that new single, can we hear a little bit? Can you sing about a little, a little something, something? <laughs> I never knew love could be real until I saw you. I never knew how love would feel until I touched you. I never knew what love could do the way you changed my life. Now it's better than even I, I realized. I, ne I never knew. <laughs> 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 this became karaoke. Everybody do it <laughs> yeah. So y'all can go to KennyLattimore.com. And I know she's talking about seeing you virtually. I hope I can see you face to face like this live with my band and touring and all of that. So that's what we're gearing up for for the fall. I love good, you. Good. 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 Love it. Uh, I'm going to make this announcement here. Nobody's ever heard this. We have a new podcast called Dear Current Wifey coming out. <laughs> We're going to be introducing couples, relationships. We're going to shoot it in Dallas. Uh, <laughs> I want you to be our first guest. <laughs> no, uh, I got a new album coming out called um, Our Kids Are Teens. I'll sing a little bit for you if you want. Yeah. We got kids that are teens. Thank you, DJ Mowski. Uh, that's the only song, and that's uh, it's a TikTok that's album song. only. Uh, but no, we have a, a podcast called Marriage Be Hard that uh, comes out on Melissa's YouTube channel. Hold on, Kevin. I just got a notification um, that I have to renew my membership for y'all's app. Oh, yeah. yeah. I got that today. Studio. I said, it's ironic. You, you're on the podcast and they said you want to uh, renew your membership. So I'm renewing. And I need it. you to do yeah. that, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm so proud of you, man. What I love about uh, Kev on stage... Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, what, what I love about him is that while he was waiting for a seat at the table, he decided to just build his own, own studio. And so a lot of times we're waiting and we're faithing, asking God to open up doors. When God gave us a hammer, he gave us some nails, he gave us a wood, we can go build our own door. And so I've watched you over the years, uh, all the way back from Playmakers, and I watched you actually strategize and build and dominate this social media game. And uh, you're just doing an exceptional job, King, and I salute you. Thank you, thank you yeah, very much. Yeah. Thank you, God bless you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Melissa. Yes. Um, I have a new show on the Kev on Stage Studios app called The Honey Do List. Um, it's a modern take on the newlywed game. It's a lot of fun. Definitely take it out. Obviously, we have a podcast called Marriage Be Hard, where we interview a ton of couples. A couple of y'all, I did one on a podcast specifically. Y'all right here. here. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to hit y'all up. Uh, yeah. Really, really great conversations. Tammy Franklin's in the building. One of her, our favorite, one of my favorite episodes. Um, the Warrens are in the building. One of my favorite episodes. So, definitely make sure yeah. to check it out. Yeah. And um, I host a podcast with my sister called Jen and Juice. You should check out as well. And I, and I watched y'all show Love on stage. Uh, you know, I was a fan of that. What I love about y'all is y'all was extremely real and authentic, and I knew people that was on y'all's show. But a lot of times on these dating shows, they'll sensationalize it. They'll put you in conflict and situations to get you to act out of character because they're producing good TV. Uh, shout out to my homie Tammy Franklin and Kirk. They actually have a show called The One. Uh, so congratulations on them. Tammy, where you at? T tell me over there somewhere, I can't see. Where you at, Tammy? Oh, there she go, stand up there. Tammy, there it is. How you doing? I'm so proud of you and the show The One. I love to see you actually be in the forefront and do what you do. You've been friends for years and I'm just so proud of you. Um, listen, we're gonna open it up for y'all to have questions. Uh, let's get a microphone down here. <clears throat> uh, you, ain't, you ain't asked me what I was doing. Mowski, what you doing? What you got coming up, Mowski? I'm glad you asked. 
Talk to what you got coming up, King. Got a new touring, a new touring party called Club Hope coming for everybody who's a believer but still wants to come out and have some fun like we did earlier today. Got a new book called Remix Your Life that's coming out soon. Just got off tour with a fantastic artist, an artist that's that's the voice uh, for this generation uh, named Jonathan McReynolds. He's sitting right here. Yeah. And uh, a lot of good stuff. Um, I'm going to put him on blast and he's going to be angry at me for this, but he has something to say. I have nothing to say. <laughs> I have nothing to say. Incredible panel, incredible people. Wow. <laughs> I love it all. Jonathan crazy. That's it. I've been trying That's to get it. I've been trying to get Jonathan on the podcast for a while. So mm -mm. we're gonna, Not gonna happen. He'll be mm -mm. so dope. He just a lot of people always DM me and be like, Jonathan, and he and I have discussed that, but he just ain't mm -mm. ready yet. Mm -mm. Yep. So that's what I got going. Thanks for asking. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I was very concerned mm -hmm. about what you had. Thank Listen, you. I, but I'm proud of you. So one thing that and I love how things come around full circle. Uh, as we discussed earlier, DJ Mosky um, was a DJ. Uh, and I met him for the first time at Faith and Kenny's wedding. And I was like, this dude is good. Like, he just, he has a, such an anointing and a command over the audience. And I was like, man, this is really, really dope. And so when I was talking to, to the Stellar's team, we talked about having an after party, which we we're going to transition into. And um, I brought up his name and they said, we were about to use him for a party anyway. And we were going to do this. And he said, we're on the same alignment. And then they called him and I thank you for, for showing up. So, hey, how you doing? That's yeah, the Stellar team right here. The Stellar team right over there. Yes, y'all give it up. Take a stand. Can y'all stand up, please? Michelle, can y'all... Yeah, Ron, yeah, yeah, stand up. Listen, give it up for them. This would not have been possible if it wasn't for them. I appreciate y'all so much. Listen, I'm, I'm humbled by uh, everything that y'all have done by curating this opportunity to be at this prestigious event. Um, do we have microphones in the audience? We're going to take a couple of questions. We're going to do about uh, a 10, 15-minute Q&A, and then we're going to turn up and have fun. Any questions? Oh, right here. Stand, stand up. Where's the... Oh, there she goes. I feel like we on a game show. Yeah. We're good. Um, my name is Brittany. I'm from Virginia. And I've followed the um, podcast for a while. So thank you so much for it. Um, as Lexi and Bishop Sapp, I'm of the Bereaved Committee and the sister over there. So yeah. seven years since my husband passed. And I am interested in getting back out into the dating world. I have two children. I've been blessed to parent. Um, since his passing, and um, I realized I didn't, I guess I had such an amazing marriage, and we've had such a, we had a, such an amazing journey, that it's hard for me to accept that I could find better. Mm. And, and almost like I have so many single friends alongside me, I'm like, maybe they should go first, because I've already had it. Yeah. And, sh and it's hard for me to accept that I sh should have love again, so... Um, any advice on how to, I guess, make that step? Um, wow. <sighs> I can remember very clearly when my wife was going through the final stages of preparing to transition from this life to life eternal. And um, I, remember us, I remember sitting by her bedside at my home. And uh, Lexi, you heard this story before. And my wife said to me, she said, Marvin, I want you to give me a gift. And I said, anything, because um, I knew it was getting close. She was, you know, the process when, you know, they sleep, they stay up and the whole process. She said, I want you to give me a gift. And I said, well, what, anything, whatever you want. She said, promise me that you will live. Mm. promise me that you will live and I said wow this woman is close to taking her last breath and the thing that she wants for me the most is to live so many times because we are individuals who have had good marriages we feel like you feel but the greatest gift that you can give your late spouse is to live because he wouldn't want you to stop. 
just because he's no longer here. Um, you may never, I live with a therapist. You know, I tell people I was in counseling for 18 years. That's how long I was married to my wife. Um, you may never find that, and you won't find it. But what you have to learn how to do is, is you have to learn how to understand that what you had during that season of your life is not what you need in the next season. What I had from 23 to 43 ain't what I needed 56. And when you understand that, it'll make it easier for you to make that transition. Don't compare. There's absolutely, positively no comparison. Mm. It's not out there. And, but there is something that's great. I always say this. I say this all the time. God has made me a promise. He made me some promises, and he's going to bring in the past. And remember this in my closing. You can't be anything to anyone until you're everything to yourself. Yeah. So be that first, and then everything else will go for it. That's good. That's good. Next question. I'm single, and I definitely want to... Put the microphone close to your mouth, please. Yes. I'm single, and I would love to have, like, what you have. Do you have any recommendations on how I should date? I get a lot of options, but what do you think, as a married woman, how I should be dating? Um, this is an excellent question, and one of the things that I um, stand really firm in is what I know I know and what I don't I don't, and I've been married since I was 21, 20, 21 years old. I started dating Kevin at 16. I know absolutely nothing about marriage, dating. I mean, just nothing, okay? Yeah. Just, I don't want to give you the fake, like, what you need to do is, and fine, girl, I don't know. I really don't. My, my, my honest advice would be, number one, I know I'm, I'm useless, girl. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just you say useless. useless. You use useless? Just useless. <laughs> I mean, but I really, I have not been in these COVID dating streets. Yeah. I just haven't. And so I really, I don't know. But I will say this, therapy. Therapy. Work through your own personal traumas. Understand the personality types that make you tick. Understand yeah. the personality types that don't make you tick. Yeah. The ones that you jive with, the ones that you don't jive with. Um, understand what uh, you're looking for in a partner. Understand what your the true non-negotiables are. Not the like height differences, but like their core values of a person. Um, understand what all of those are so you don't waste your time with people you know, you, you just know it's not going to work. And listen to your intuition. At the end of the night when you're laying in your bed and the Holy Ghost is telling you this ain't the one, but you still hold on, listen yeah. to that. Yeah. That would be my single best pieces of advice from a person that's been married for a long time and ain't got no advice to give. <laughs> Faith. Faith. As a former professional dater, <laughs> I can answer this question. Um, I... To echo a point that you made that I learned the hard way, when I learned what I liked and what I didn't like, I didn't throw all of that out of the window when somebody cute came along. So when I met somebody who I thought was really attractive, but there were certain things that I knew based on my dating experience that these things would not work for me. And these things would work for me. So knowing that, having that knowledge, having that experience, I took that with me on my path. And so I was able to recognize very early on, before I ever even went out with somebody, Bishop, you said something. When so I was um, in LA and I had a friend who wanted to introduce me to a certain actor. This is before I met my, my husband. And at this point, I already knew things that would work for me publicly as well as privately. So, you know, we all have these digital, digital footprints now yep. that in thumbprints that we make because of what we choose to share online. I just looked and perused his social media. And I'm sure this is a person who a lot of people would have been interested in going out with. A lot of people would have inter been interested in dating. I chose no, not to even have that first date because I just knew this is not the type of personality that I think would gel and fit with me 
based on what I know about myself. When you know yourself better than anybody else, when you know yourself, when you know who you are, what you like, what you don't, what your boundaries are, and all of those things, and you stay true to that, when you're out and you meet people, you will be, it will be much easier for you to make better decisions early on about who is a good fit for you and if you are a good fit for them. Right, good, good. Next question. Stand up, stand up. Okay, so my name is Bree. Um, I remember. Hey. I'm surprised you remember me. All right. Um, so I have an observation. I, I just, anybody could give me some clarity on it or what you think the situation is. So um, being young and getting to know Christ, coming straight in a college ministry, it was like the men or young men at that time, they were very, I love the Lord, and I am out here looking for s someone, right? Um, I was very shy, stayed to the back, didn't date. Now, I'm 40 years old, saved and serious, and just recently said, okay, you need to be intentional about your personal life. You need to really put yourself out there. It's more than work in church, right? But then I come to events like this, shout out, went to Jamaica, yeah. um, and I know that you have a great following of even men. However, the ratio doesn't reflect it. I am, um, when I would typically be at home, I'm out here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I went to Jamaica, right? Why we don't see, now worldly men, they're going to go to the club. They're going to go to the bar. they out I'm there, to there. And they are hollering. But Christian men, where? So what is your perspective as to why they don't seem to show up? You know, I'm still, trying to, figure, like I'm still trying to figure that out, to be honest with you. I don't know the answer to that. And that's what I want to do. I'm going to do an intentional Adam, where are you tour. I want to go find the Adams. I want to go find why they don't show up, why in singles ministry is still 90% uh, uh, women. I want to find out why when you have an event, when I did a, a, a self-love soiree for Valentine's and I was like, we're going to be suited and booted and we want to have this beautiful curated event, a lot of men ain't going to go to that. And so I'm still trying to figure out where to go find these guys and create something um, and I'm planning on doing this trip where it's going to be straight focused on men and then the women can come as a, Le as a byproduct Le of Leteris, this. Leteris, John has an answer. Jonathan McReynolds has Jonathan, an answer. Come on. Jonathan has an answer. He has an answer. Every time I make a face, say they with already your, they Say it with your chest, my guy. You say a lot of stuff. I think a lot of stuff. You, yeah, you think. <laughs> use wisdom, but say what you say. I am going to use wisdom. Lord. Yes, pray. Mm -hmm. Stretch your hands towards him. He got to an answer. Them. <laughs> I... I I can answer, I can, I can give an answer to that. I can't answer for all guys or whatever. But here's the thing. He's buffering. It's okay. <laughs> He's buffering. It's coming. <laughs> Did you say buffering? He's buffering. It's the I'm spinning filtering. wheel. Yeah. Filtering. filtering. I'm yeah. filtering. One thing that women have to understand about men, particularly the type of men that you guys probably would want, is that relationships are not the number one thing on our mind. It's not the number one pursuit. It's not the thing that keeps us awake at night. It's not the thing that we want to grab a whole bunch of books about. It's not the thing that we want to unify to talk about, especially with y'all. <laughs> he said with y'all. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, in general, when it comes to any kind of content that is about strictly relationships, women are the ones that prioritize that higher. If you want to grab us, just say it's about basketball. <laughs> say it's about <laughs> finance. Say it's about how to get ahead in this and that. Have a really, <laughs> some really dope barbers there to give us the best haircuts of our life. But at the end of the day, I think and I, I, I don't want to say too much, and this is why I never got on my brother Leteris' panel. 
is because there's some huge misunderstandings, some huge gaps um, between, I believe, how women see things and how men see things. And one of the main sins you're going you to commit if you're a woman is thinking that we're thinking about the stuff that you're thinking about as much as you're thinking about it. That's real. It's real. That's, That's real. real. That's real. You have created, you've analyzed, you've figured out, you're getting more education about it, you're talking amongst it in your group chat, everything. We do that, but about, like, real estate. <laughs> we do that, but about, like, LeBron and the fact that he's not as good as Michael Jordan. <laughs> See, you see how you just woke up? See, I'm just saying, but what, what I'm saying is like, <laughs> ultimately, and then, because that would inform you and realize that most of the stuff that we even do in relationship is more reactive. It's less thought out. Y'all have plotted out moves. We're making a beeline to the, to the one thing that we want. That depends on how godly the man is. <laughs> That's all I'm saying is that we aren't there because the places that we are and the places that we really want to fit a woman, it's not, we don't live in a world that's centered yet around relationship with a woman. Fair enough. That's that I, Fair I enough. just want to echo what John said. I, I want to make it even more clear. He was being very nice. Uh, crystallize it. Men are not socialized Thank you. to want to desire relationships. Men are taught to protect and provide. And a lot of times I think men don't feel like if their life isn't to a certain point, they can even go out to women. So if they're not making enough money or have their own house or whatever, and as costs rise, that's getting harder and harder yes. to obtain. And men see other men get eviscerated on social media for not having enough bread, $200 dates, and they like, I ain't even really ready to join this conversation, nor am I socialized, nor is it top of mind. Um, a lot of times women are socialized. If you ain't married, that's why you're single, you ain't got no kids, you're gonna have cats. A same age man as you is not getting that same pressure. <laughs> A 40-year-old man is not getting the pressure to get married that you are getting. So yeah. he's not feeling like I got, now I might need to get a job. Internal pressure isn't to find a wife and start a family. It's to get your money up, do that type of stuff. So that's why no matter how good a terrorist is, he gonna be, he's going to be pulling teeth. When we do the dating shows, we get the casting, thousands of women. You have to recruit the men personally because... Yes. You can't, they, they're not just saying, I need to be married for my life to feel whole. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they're just not. So I, didn't make, I don't want to make that harsh for you, but that's where it is. A man will see this flyer and be like, that ain't for me. I'm going to go to the next thing because he don't feel bad if he don't have a wife at the same time as you do. That's real. And that's real. And we ought to think about how we were raised. I'll give it up for the Kevin. But we ought to think about how we were raised, like the first toys that you know, little girls get are toys that are, you know, when I was growing up, they'll get the little Easy Bake Oven, they'll get the Barbie and Ken, teaching them how to do life and teach them about love and stuff. And then we get stuff like a fire truck. We, we get stuff that's about careers. And so we, as a very young age, we're cultivated to think about career and money and, and young girls are taught, taught about family and building the familial structure. Uh, next question, we'll take two more questions. We're gonna wrap it up. Brother, yes, I love when I get a brother. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with the notion that men don't think about relationships and love and everything. Um, it just depends on where you're at with your walk. Because, um, like, after I gave my life to God, like, I found myself, like, I, I focused on love because I felt like the greatest thing for me was a wife. I'm not married, I'm single, but the greatest gift to me from God is a wife. So I bought, I bought this brother's books. <laughs> I bought the four love languages. Um, I just studied it. <laughs> huh? Hey. So what you say? He ain't gonna be hey. single for long. Hey. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. My Talk man said, oh, I got all these women Turn in around. here. I got all these women in here. What you talking about? We don't think about love. I think about love right here. He, he took advantage of that, boy. To one ratio. Look, look. Like, look, I love God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Great move. Be like, not I'm true, true, but great. I mean, true for you. 
For all men, but that was solid work. I see you. Now, he like, I want to go to Jamaica. Solid work. It's I want to go to Jamaica. It was an excellent choice. <laughs> <laughs> and I see him behind you like, what are you he doing after? Options. Perfect. <laughs> he pushed yeah. play on the plan, and we love it for you, bro. We love it. Bro. <laughs> nah, I, I like his music, but I don't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all let I me got. Ask, oh. Let me ask a question to I you. ran out of mic huh? minutes. Just okay. out of curiosity, how old are you? I'm 38. Okay. I mentored a lot of the guys that Bree is talking about. You were baptized in the pool at my house. Now, when a man is 20, all of this stuff that, that Jonathan said, straight, straight truth, we're not thinking about that. We're social, everything that, that Kev said. We are socialized completely different. It is at another time that we become mature. And it's beyond just, uh, you know, what we want in the time. There are lots of pressures, just like you, you have the pressure of hearing things that are, like, that are inappropriate, like, why aren't you married? Yeah. When are you going to have children? All those kind of things, and you're like, well, I don't even know if I want to have kids. I don't even yeah. know. How to, you haven't figured it out. We have the pressure, like they said, of what do you do? Not who, who are you. So, like, when, I, when I'm mentoring a lot of the guys now, I, I have this thing where, you know, people say, who are you? I, I try to come up with other adjectives. Oh, I'm a father. That's the reason why I say I'm a father. I'm a husband. You know, I'm an entertainer. Yes, I am. But I, and I'm a lover of Christ as opposed to I'm a singer and a Grammy nominee and all that. We try to build ourselves up because we're constantly trying to be what we think that you want. And isn't it crazy that you, you kind of do that too? But women do it differently. You morph into who you think we want you to be. Yeah. Which is a really tough kind of situation. So there's a couple things I'm thinking about. I made a list before I got married to Faith. And I had to figure out who I was first. I made a list. A lot of times we can make that list. This is what I want. I want this. I want this. I want this. Who am I? What are my core values? I had to put that together because what I realized too is if I met the right woman, I couldn't really tell her who I was. I couldn't tell her who I was and what I was really about. I'm about family. I'm about truth. I'm about honesty. I'm about respect. I'm about kindness. What is my vision for myself? Just like in, in Habakkuk, it says, write the vision and make it plain yeah. so that other folk can run with it, not just you. I wrote it so that if my wife wanted to know who is this man that I'm really trying to connect myself with, that I would have my own vision of who I was. A lot of that stuff came later on in life. That wasn't something that I thought about at 25, 30, 35, 40 even. That's why I asked that question because I love the fact that you're able to articulate who you are at this time in your life. But most men are not because of how we are socialized and maybe we're just a little different. I mean, women, y'all, y'all are smarter in a whole lot. <laughs> From an emotional standpoint, you're far more in, uh, emotionally intelligent than we are at those ages. And we've got to really understand those dynamics about how the Lord made us. Because there's something about that dynamic that actually works. Yeah. Or it wouldn't be the case. But we don't treasure our differences. Either. Yeah. We're constantly thinking, you got to think like me. You got to be like me. You got to be, I accomplished this. You got to come. We're never going to come to um, a place of partnership if we are walking in that type of direction. So it really has so much more to do with individuals. It is a tough one out there. I know it's got to be tough dating. I'm glad I'm not in the dating streets too. Yeah. But it is, a, it is all of these things. All these, you might think that they're on different sides. Or every single thing that everybody's saying up here has a significant point because the Lord has made us so individual. He's made us so individual and so different from one another. But we have to respect and honor the fact that you're different. You're, you're, the way you came up was different. I loved when you said that. The way that he came up was co completely different. So it, it skewed their perspective when they're really moving in the same direction. They yeah. want the same thing. Yeah. But in order to get to the compromise and figure out all that, it takes some maturity. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Question? My name Where? is Where? Dawn. 
and Bree triggered um, something. I'm from Los Angeles County, and not only where are the men, but when they are present, they don't say hi, they don't speak to you, and they just watch you walk by. <laughs> and the ones that speak are the ones that have um, our work or something, for, you know, those kind. And we'll say, hi, baby, but the other ones will not speak. And it's prevalent in Los Angeles County. And I consider myself to be an attractive woman. You know? It's poor parenting. And it's just like, and I, I'm just going to say this. I'm going to say this, and I'm not trying to, you know, hurt anybody's feelings. But this was an example. I was up there, and I don't know anyone, but who said Hi. But it's just like we're invisible in a sense. Black women, we're like invisible. And can we be acknowledged by our black men? But you saw, some of this is about mentoring as well. If you ask the average black man what he got if he complimented a black woman, you may be an exception and a wonderful woman, but when they go out and they compliment we're in a society that lives in, we're in fear constantly with the Me Too, the all, all kind of different things are going on. And I'm not saying that those things are not true. They are absolutely true. But because they exist and we're in a flawed society, we're in a situation where people are afraid. Men are just as afraid, you know, as much as we come in and we have our bravado and all that. What'd you say, dear? You make sure... And keep doing that. You want to be a person. Keep doing that. That's wise. Yeah. That's wisdom. But I just want us to acknowledge the fact that people are afraid. It is on the news every day. There's, there's stories. There's different things that keep, in social media, that keep telling us that we need to be afraid. Good. From the, from the police. From every, we need to be afraid. And we've got to break that cycle. I love mm -hmm. the fact that you are. You, you're a wise mm -hmm. woman, though. Keep smiling, too, girl. I saw you up there. Yeah. I'm, I, I saw you up there walking around. I saw you up there, thirsty. I mean, went to the bar. I saw you. But here, here's another thing. Here's another thing. Here's, here's what I was, it's just my opinion. I'm just going to give my opinion. Keep being beautiful. But don't look from that validation from no, nobody outside of you and God. That validation got to come from you. Cause you can walk in a sea of guys you don't want no attention from nobody that you ain't supposed to be with anyway. You feel me? You got dressed and you pulled up and you did it. Uh-uh, I ain't bringing the mic over there. Uh-uh, I said it already. But, but no, I think it's great that you did it, but just keep in mind that you are beautiful. You do look amazing. And I'm going to give you a compliment, Mal. I'm going to tell you. And men notice it, you know, but that's kind of where we at. LaTaris, you laughing? Because I'm going to put a song on I'm laughing at Lexi over here. She said you'll give her a compliment, but would you give her a kiss? Amen, Lexi. All right, last, last question. You ain't. This you is my last question right here. Hi. Um, thank you, God, for letting me make it here safely. I'm new to your podcast, and um, it reminds me so much of testimony service. And I've never, I haven't seen this anywhere. And my question is specifically to you, Latiris. Would you consider adding to your podcast moving forward, an invitation to Jesus Christ, because you have so much influence and everybody that watches you isn't saved and they might just need to hear it from you to say, if you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus, I implore you to call out to him and ask him to save you. They might just need to hear it from you. Thank you and thank you for everybody who's a servant of Christ. Amen. Amen. I have people come on my podcast that share their testimony. The Bible says that people are overcome by the word of a testimony and by the blood of the lamb. So it's a very testimonial type of podcast. Um, but in that, I like to win people to salvation by the life that we live instead of just heavy handed, just saying, hey, you give your life to Christ. I get a lot of people who DM me and I walk them through salvation all the time. It's an episode with... Um, 
um, Tavia and Jewel. And in that episode, they were going through a challenging time in their relationship. They were approaching 25 years of marriage and they were calling it quits. And these were, these were my personal friends. And so the podcast sponsored their therapy. Uh, the husband wasn't a Christian. I knew he wasn't a Christian, but I can't tell him, give your life to Christ while he's, his whole marriage is falling apart. He don't even want to be married. And so I allow professionals to work with him on his mental stability, and then salvation came and followed. And then you heard him on the podcast. I came back and did part two, and he said, I didn't even know how to love my wife until I learned how to fall in love with Christ. And so it's through that example. And so God has been curating this. The Bible says, he that wins souls is wise. And so the way that I bring salvation to the hearts of people across the world is I, I leave the pastors, the bishops, the, the churches to do what they do, and then I fully own and submit to the work that God has given me, which is bringing people to salvation through the, the story of love. And you always hear me say that. I've never been, um, I'm very unapologetic about my faith. It's moments that I had where I had my boy Mike Bethany on there a couple of episodes ago that we just straight went into worship. I mean, we'll go into worship on my podcast. Uh, I, you'll hear me speaking in tongues on my podcast unapologetically because that's who I am. And so I live the life that I, that I talk about. And so people see the transparency, they see the authenticity, and then that's what make them go, how did, you, how did you become this dude? You always talk about your faults. I've had a lot of Christians that, that tell me, you talk about you cheating on your wife in the past too much. I was like, that's my journey. This podcast wouldn't even exist had I not went through the broken stage of breaking this woman in order for me to learn and live the life that I live now. And so uh, the Bible says that uh, I boast in my weakness. Paul says I boast in my weakness. And so that's the life that I live. I start sharing those things where I say I'm not perfect, but I'm showing you a perfect God, even though I'm a walking failure and I'm learning to grow and heal in front of the world. So that's the Dear Future Wifey podcast. So listen, did y'all enjoy this? Did y'all really enjoy this? Again, I give it up. Let's give it up to our sponsors. DJ Mosky, take it over from here. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit, live intentionally and transparently, and don't stop loving. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.